wanted you to know. Hold on. Why people... No, no, no. Don't, don't tell me what I'm going to say. Tell me about the Bilderberg Group. You know nothing okay, about the Mr. Bilderberg Group, we're not, which we're your not Prime Minister debate, and no. your major owner of your newspapers is a member of. I, I, so is the British I, Prime Minister. The media here won't cover it. There's a conspiracy theory that a shadowy elite of bankers and businessmen and politicians and media moguls are secretly controlling the governments of the world. They start the wars, they cause the famines, they control the governments, they choose the presidents, both candidates, they tell them what to do, they're setting up the one world order. The theory goes that these elitists plan to create an all-powerful new world order, a world government that will destroy anyone who disobeys them. If I could explain to you who they were from the top down, we could just get a whole bunch of rope and go hang a bunch of them. And they're a despicable organization. But now, some conspiracy theorists believe they've uncovered the name of the secret cabal. They say their cover is now blown, that they are called the Bilderberg Group. We're being followed. It is spring in Portugal, and I am being chased by unknown forces, by the henchmen of the powerful, shadowy elite known as the Bilderberg Group. Well, we don't really know what to do, having never been followed before. The British Embassy have washed their hands of me, and I'm finding myself out of my depth, alone, except for a cameraman and a conspiracy theorist called Big Jim Tucker, who isn't being much help. Looks like we have a waiting game here. What will happen next? How did I get here? How many people in Britain have heard of the Bilderberg Group? In America, anywhere around the world? The Bilderberg Group, what's that? Well, and I understand that. No one ever talks about it, really. But I've talked to journalists about the Bilderberg Group. Bilderberg Group, what's that? I haven't got a bloody clue. So, isn't it funny? that the Bilderberg Group seems to be rather influential. Tony Blair, Bilderberg Group. Gordon Brown, Bilderberg Group. Leading players in the present British government. Now, of course, the opposition chancellor uh, to Gordon Brown was Kenneth Clark. Bilderberg Group. Let's look at the head of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, Bilderberg Group. Let's look at the first two heads of the World Trade Organization, Peter de Sutherland of Ireland and Renato Ruggiero of Italy, Bilderberg Group. Wherever you look, this thing comes up and no one's ever friggin' heard of it. There's something unique about Bilderberg conspiracy theories and that their roots can be traced back to just one man. He's the man who brought Bilderberg to the conspiracy theory world. His name is Big Jim Tucker and he's invited me to join him while he attempts to infiltrate the Bilderberg group. Mother, your dutiful son is playing kick the can on Pennsylvania Avenue on Tuesday morning. Thank you. This is Washington, D.C., where every morning Jim makes a coded telephone call to inform the outside world that the Bilderberg group has not had him killed the night before. I think if they ever got me, it'd be set up like a typical Washington mugging. Somebody kills somebody for a few bucks and another three paragraphs in the newspaper. So it's pretty dangerous. Well, Bilderbergs take themselves quite seriously, obviously. Jim and his newspaper, The Spotlight, have been chasing the Bilderberg group for 30 years. Like a game of cat and mouse, Jim says, or a battle between good and evil. There are some people who would refuse to believe. And you see that among cliché liberals every day. Some people also cling to ignorance. Some people choose not to believe. It's just too uncomfortable believing that 120 of the world's most powerful men can go behind locked and guarded doors make decisions that affect all of us. Now, what about these people who say that the Bilderberg Group's just a social meeting? Well, first off, you've had many newspaper editors who claim there is no Bilderberg Group and that it does not meet. If they were just going to meet socially, they wouldn't worry about all the armed guards and so forth. They'd just play golf and swap lies and chase girls or whatever they do. Well, we're still waiting for the world to admit that they exist. It was hard for me to believe what the spotlight journalists were sure of, that every major international power shift could be traced back to this group that few people have ever heard of. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. 
Richard Nixon was forced out of office. A lot of people say that he was lucky to have uh, survived with his life. Uh, they uh, expedited John F. Kennedy's removal from office, but as I say, people speculated that they decided it would be too messy to have another president shot down in the streets of American cities. So well, there's quite a laundry list. They seem to have their evil hands in most of the upheavals of the world. The Persian Gulf War, raising taxes in America, the downfall of Lady Thatcher as Prime Minister of Britain. Now it's time for a new chapter to open, and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. Jim says he once sidled up to Lady Thatcher and asked her how she felt about the Bilderberg Group secretly orchestrating her downfall. And her response to be denounced by Bilderberg, I consider a, a tribute. Any head of state who would surrender his sovereignty to some international organization should not be head of state. She spoke very strongly about surrendering British sovereignty to the European Union. And that's why they manipulated to kick her out and replace her with a trapeze artist from her own party. And of course now, Tony Blair who attends Bilderberg meetings and receives his orders. Thank you very much. Goodbye. In her going, she discovered to her cost that a British Prime Minister cannot govern without the consent and support of colleagues. Jim says that the Bilderberg Group meet once a year, always in a five-star hotel with golfing facilities. He says they may play golf when they're there, but they're not there to play golf. His job is to find out which hotel in advance. Last week, Jim was at a function where he met an accountant who told him that one of his clients, a Bilderberg member, was off to Portugal for a private meeting. Once you know, for instance, it's Portugal, then you set about finding what would be the likely place. It's got to be a remote resort. And then sometimes they say, well, what I'm concerned about is I'm supposed to be attending a meeting of the Bilderberg Group, and I want to make sure I'm going to the right place. Then they go upstairs to management. Yes, you're coming to the right place. Well, thank you, sir. Jim says he's ready to cause some trouble. He intends to thwart Bilderberg security and charge in to confront them red-handed. He says, I'm welcome to come along, just so long as I don't step on twigs while we're on the prowl. When are you going to get there? I'll leave on the last day of this month. I'm going to try to start patrolling their resort on Sunday, figure out ways to penetrate where the short wall is, where the big drain pipe is located. Mother, your handsome lad is dancing a macaroni in Portugal on Monday morning. I'll call you tomorrow. Jim believes he's narrowed his search to the Caesar Park Hotel and Golfing Resort in the mountains of Sintra, near Lisbon. A few of them might swing a golf club a little while, but uh, that, I doubt if you'll see many of them on the golf course. They're, they're going to be busy. They've, they've got a world to run. Let's be salesmen. Salesmen? Yeah, but we don't want to talk shop today, we say. Just to have a break, have a little fun. But surely every undercover journalist says he's a salesman. But it's easy to remember. If we try to be three different things, we get mixed up over who's who. What do we sell? Well, we just don't want to talk business. We're having fun. Just want to relax a little bit. It was our first working day in Portugal. The plan was to look for the short wall and the big drain pipe in preparation for the midnight penetration later in the week. There it is. Security so this is it, Jim. Looks like it. Yeah, it looks like they still have uh, civilians checking out today. Idiot-proof camera. Got you. Jim photographed the civilians. These photographs would later appear in the spotlight underneath the headline, Unaware Civilians. 
If we had lunch here on Thursday, we wouldn't have to make reservations, would we? For Thursday? For, for Thursday. Uh -huh. Just a sec. My, my chief is talking to me, okay? Tactically, it's important to be very ignorant because at this level, there'd be, but that's it. There's people making inquiries inside the hotel. There's people inquiring. Yeah. 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 If we came back for lunch on Thursday, we wouldn't have to make reservations. Would well, we? but um, it has happened one thing. The, the hotel is a reservation for a big group. Uh, we don't accept uh, nobody to coming to outside oh. uh, for one week. Oh. Yes. So that last it's uh, exclusive for, for the group. Hotel. private group. Yes, uh -huh. that's right. How are you feeling inside of yourself right now being here? Pumped up for the ball game. Like a redskin quarterback, 15 minutes before the kickoff. Later, Jim said that the police motorcycle signaled the start of the big shutdown. He said an hour later, we wouldn't have got near the place. Jim, I think we're being followed. I'm not sure that we're being followed after all. It, it could be innocent. We had fruitlessly scanned the newsstands for references to Bilderberg. There was nothing in the mainstream papers. Jim said that a media blackout was in operation. I didn't know what to think. But there was one exception. The Weekly News is a tiny English-language parish newspaper for British expats. They've gone big on the story. We're going to meet with the reporter from a local newspaper in Lisbon who's given heavy attention to the upcoming Bilderberg meeting. And we share all the information we can get with each other. And that way we can expose the jackasses. We got an email through from New York saying, you know, how can you allow these people to meet in your country? And I sent an email back to the guy and said, who are they? I've never heard of them. Who are Bilderberg? He sent me back some information and found that this was the um, rather tip of an iceberg. So are you finding yourself thinking of conspiracy theories? I find myself out of my depth, actually. Uh, yes, you... you if... 10% of these people came to this country in the normal way, it would be in all the newspapers. What is the agenda that we shouldn't know? These are powerful people. They have the ability to steer the way the world will go. Jim and I spent the day at the Weekly News. It turned out that Paul's suspicions about Bilderberg were slightly less objective than they'd first seemed. But a lot of Christians believe that we are in end times, and the Bible generally talks of the way that the world will move, um, a sense of disorder, uh, of, of children not respecting their parents, of extreme, and it, it would appear to suggest also that we move towards the forming of a very powerful group. Do you think Paul's getting a bit carried away thinking this is... Well, this I consider the bad guys now, I don't know <laughs> if uh, they're actually Satanist or not. We're not Satanist, I mean, we're, we're talking actually Satan, you know, himself. Does Paul think that uh, this is some kind of biblical prophecy being fulfilled? Uh-huh. I don't know. I really don't know. Mother, your dutiful son is playing Kick the Can in Portugal on Wednesday morning. Thank you. The next day brought a strange development. The new weekly news was supposed to hit the newsstands today. Another Bilderberg expose. The news. The news. No, no, We're five kilometers away from where the Bilderberg conference is being held, and the newspaper is not yet. This is the very first time ever in all the years we've been 
we've been working with this paper that uh, uh, this has happened, uh, that uh, it gets distributed in the Algarve and it doesn't get distributed in this area. Amazing. One of the Bilderberg members is the owner of the printing press that prints Paul's newspaper. And they control the... Uh... Distribution. Uh-huh. You can have a crooked mind and think, uh, is it a coincidence that the man that prints our papers, could that be that man had anything to do with it? But the paper did appear a few hours later. Fred and Brendan were just being paranoid. We were all becoming a little paranoid. It is easy to be sucked up into the paranoia. So this is the scene of the crime. This was supposed to be an easy day. Jim simply wanted to verify that the complete shutdown of the Caesar Park had been accomplished. The plan was to drive up there and be turned away at the gate. Then we'd drive back to our hotel for a leisurely afternoon by the pool and in the bar. Hi. Hi. Just going to the hotel. Hotel, man. Mm. But it was not to be. The gatekeeper lifted the barrier and waved us in with a cheerful smile. I'm surprised already. So we're back inside. Shucks, when I saw those cops deploring yesterday, I thought... thought this would be it. The hotel was deserted. There was nobody else there. This was unnerving. We had lunch and quickly left. David Barker, the cameraman, did the driving because we didn't expect anything to happen. But something did happen, so I picked up my home video camera. Well, there's nothing subtle about it, is there? Somebody tailing us again? Yep. Yeah, I can see him in the rear view mirror back there. Looks like we have a waiting game here. Now the poor fool doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know if we're going to turn around and go the other way. Should we do? Just do what we're doing. Stop acting suspiciously. Abide by the rules, the laws of the country. And we're not breaking any law. Here he comes. He's behind us. He's behind us again, Jim. Yes. I can I couldn't see him. He's there. Uh... Oh yeah. He's hanging way back. Is he pulling up? Oh, yeah, he's stopped. And he knows that we know he's there. So who could it be? Bilderberg security of some kind. He's not going to move till we move. Do you think they might shoot us? I don't think so. I think it'd be too big of a story to have a, a fat old dead reporter lying on the shoulder. Um. More humorist. I tell them that that'll help. We were followed back to our hotel. Is he still there? Yeah, he's still there. He keeps stepping behind a tree. We're playing peekaboo. So if the bit of plastic 
is on the floor when we get back. Instead of in the door, we know somebody's been in the room. I've got one on this door as well. This is because when I came back to my room just now, after having a walk on the beach, things had slightly moved in the room and a different key. One of these with the number 408 on it, which hadn't been there before, was in the power thing against the wall. So somebody has been in my room without question. So that's why I put a bit of plastic here and a little bit of plastic on your door. David. So if they're on the floor when we get back tonight, we're moving to another hotel. Our surveillance continued for the rest of the evening. A man in a car followed us to a bar and then to dinner and eventually I telephoned the British Embassy. No, it's OK. We're being followed. Um, well, we don't really know what to do, having never been followed before. No, he's not that serious. I explained to the British Embassy that I was essentially a humorous journalist out of my depth, and they replied with an extraordinary statement. They said that the Bilderberg Group was way out of their league, that they were just a little embassy. He's still with us. Uh, a car get between us. Well, I don't know. I was hoping that maybe there was something you could do. <laughs> Later, the British Embassy phoned me back and said they'd spoken with the Caesar Park and had been told that nobody was following us. They said we must be imagining it. They said it was all in our minds and how could they call off someone who didn't exist? Damn, I'm a goddamn idiot. <laughs> Okay, we call it Bilderberg sets a trap. Was that black car following them, or was paranoia setting in? Barker, who was driving, suddenly stopped at the roadside and the car sped by. So they were not being followed on the public highway, right? Wrong. You guys will check me for accuracy on this while we do it. Tucker climbed several steps to the swimming pool area. Chaser ran behind a tree and the two played peekaboo. When Ronson and Barker joined Tucker, they reported two new stalkers in the hotel lobby. How did they know the two men were stalking? Quote, you can tell by the smell, quote, Barker said. They left one by one. Ronson, then Barker, then Tucker. T Dave, Tucker never gave them David a didn't say you could tell by the smell. I thought I heard you say that. I don't, I, I, David's not the sort to say something like that. Uh, it was their demeanor you could tell. Did you say smell? I thought I heard you say that. Uh, you forgot. <laughs> but it's OK. You said demeanor if you wanted to say demeanor. Later, in a quiet moment, I telephoned the British Embassy and asked them to call the Caesar Park and tell them we were nothing to do with Big Jim Tucker and if they wanted to intimidate him, we were perfectly willing to turn a blind eye because he was nothing to do with us. Well, it's like we've done a day's work, fellas. Through all of this, the slither of plastic remained where it was. Perhaps they'd taken a look around and put the slither back where they'd found it. I slept fitfully that night, but nothing happened. We are approaching the scene of the crime again. Thursday. This was the day Jim said the limousines would arrive. Yeah, they're sealed up, but I don't see any reporters. If I still had my doubts, Jim said, today was the day I'd know that the world was nothing like they said it was. A five-hour wait followed. Nothing happened. Even Jim began to seem unsure. I was having doubts. For instance, why would the secret rulers of the world allow a tourist bus into their cabal. Now, how come they just let a coach party in? Could it be some Bilderberg personal staff, like their own private cooks, valets, whatever? But Brendan, the photographer from the Weekly News, later said he saw something on the coach that froze him to the spot. I expected the people inside the bus to be waiters, cleaning staff. Um, as the bus drove in, I focused on one person and he was staring at me. He surveyed me. It looked like he was staring right through me and um, actually looking down. It looked like he was looking down on me and I realised that it was Peter Mandelson. Are you sure it was Peter Mandelson? I am 100% sure it was Peter Mandelson, yes. Yeah. 
was a, it was a strange stare. It was a different type of stare. It was as if he was the only person in that bus. Everybody was looking forward and he turned sideways and go slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah, it was remarkable, it really was. Yeah. <laughs> it's a chilling tale. Yeah, chilling tale. Then, incredibly, at 5 p.m., something began to happen. Later, I managed to get a copy of the guest list, the names of the men who really did roll past us up the drive of the Caesar Park that day. There was Umberto Agnelli, chairman of Fiat. There was Paul Allaire, chairman of Xerox. There was Conrad Black, chairman of the Daily Telegraph. There was Kenneth Clark. There was Donald Graham, publisher of the Washington Post. There was Richard Holbrook, ambassador to the United Nations. There was Henry Kissinger. There was Peter Mandelson. There was William McDonough, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. There were CEOs of Nokia and Smith Klein Beecham. There was David Rockefeller, chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank. There was Robert Shapiro, CEO of Monsanto. And there was James Wolfenson, president of the World Bank. They're inside the scene of the crime now, planning their crimes. It seemed that Jim had stumbled onto something extraordinary. It seemed that Jim was right. Tonight they eat, drink and be merry. Tomorrow they start their evil work. Later that night, Jim announced he was calling off the midnight penetration. You can't get lung cancer without working at it. But it's a, it's a, maybe it's just an emotional thing that I feel like I ought to try every year. It was sad to realise that tobacco industry directors were inside the Caesar Park, and it was Jim's 60-a-day habit, his bad health, that had put pay to the midnight penetration. Later, back in Washington, Jim told me something extraordinary about the one time he met Henry Kissinger. So at this moment, I'm saying to him, uh, Dr. Kissinger, at the Bilderberg meeting near Innsbruck, Austria last June, you said this, and this other man said that. Who was that other man? For a moment, he forgot to affect his German accent. His first reaction was, well, that, that is a private meeting. Then he checked himself. That was a private meeting, or, assuming his German accent. The boy's been here since he was 14 years old. Could this be true? Could Henry Kissinger really have spent his life adopting a fake German accent to camouflage his American one? And if so, why? That was a private meeting, a private meeting. That was a private meeting, a private meeting. I was beginning to find it no longer possible to judge what was true and what wasn't. I needed to regain some rationality. And then I began to notice little things scattered around the spotlight office. I decided to check the Spotlight's credentials with the Anti-Defamation League, the world's most powerful Jewish defence organisation. The ADL's job is to determine who is and who isn't an anti-Semite. What do you know about Jim Tucker and the Spotlight? The Spotlight is the leading anti-Semitic uh, propaganda organ in the United States. Its editorial policy is very anti-Semitic and racist. And, of course, with Spotlight, all of the conspiracy theories usually circle back in upon themselves to uh, the Jews. David and I went to Portugal with, with Jim Tucker because he told us about the Bilderberg. He said that they were the secret rulers of the world. But, and I had no idea about what you're saying about Jim. I find it really utterly ludicrous that anyone could see them as the center of a world uh, conspiracy, a worldwide conspiracy. The Bilderbergers have been getting together for a large number of years. There's nothing in the public record that shows that they have any control whatsoever on governments. Just like Jim, Gail was portraying the events that occurred in Portugal as a battle between good and evil, except that in her version, the man chasing us was not the dangerous one. The evil man was sitting in my own back seat. Looks like we have a waiting game here. I think Gail felt I'd been to a dark place, 
I'd allowed myself to be beguiled by racist conspiracy theorists. I'd allowed myself to see our world through their eyes. I think that if you read their materials, you'll find that although they don't say that the Bilderberg conspiracy is a Jewish conspiracy, they like to throw in enough Jewish names so it becomes clear to the average reader or respondent that that's at the bottom of what they believe. I didn't know what to think. Had Jim been using code words all this time? Was Jim being clever? They said that you were the uh, leading anti-Semitic publication in America. They said we're number one? I told you if you stuck by me, we'd go places. <laughs> Did you have any evidence? Mm -hmm. They said that... Um, they said that when you talk about Bilderberg, you pay special attention to the Jewish members of Bilderberg. David Rockefeller is a Baptist just like me. Well, maybe not exactly like me, but yeah. he's a Baptist. He's not Jewish. Uh, I, if you think about it, I suppose Rothschilds might be Jewish, but I never thought about it. I spelled their name right. You've seen our Bilderberg coverage. Um, I would challenge the Anti-Defamation League or any of our readers to open our Bilderberg coverage and point out these, um, are they suggesting these are anti-Semitic slurs? They kind of say that you talk in code. When you say international bankers, you mean Jews. Oh, that uh, nonsense. Some screwball invented that some years ago. If you're in favor of law and order, that's a code word for racism. Uh, those jackasses try to put a chill on free speech by intimidating you. If you don't agree with the cliches I dictate to you, you're a racist. And you're supposed to cringe and say, oh, I'll agree with you. Don't call me a racist. Don't throw me in the briar patch. If I want to say Jew, I'll say Jew. If I want to say international banker or international financier, I will say international banker or international financier. But how could anyone, the ADL or the Spotlight, consider Bilderberg to be a Jewish issue? Hardly any of the Bilderbergers are Jews. This really should disqualify them from being a Jewish conspiracy. But maybe the absence of actual Jews doesn't matter to the Spotlight. Maybe Bilderberg is code for the old mythology of the shadowy Jewish cabal out to enslave the world. Frequently they refer to Jews as international financiers or they talk about um, that strange group behind the media or they talk about um, bankers or they talk about um, people who are uh, culture manipulators, the middlemen, you know, the middlemen in New York, the New Yorkers who are causing the prices to rise so that they can put it in their pockets, but not in yours. I didn't know what to make of Gail's list of code words. Some of those phrases didn't sound to me like anti-Semitic slurs. And I remembered what conspiracy theorists had said to me about the ADL. Any of us that are working to stop the New World Order, we're their enemies, and the best thing they can call us is anti-Semite, because then the whole world hates us. You say, anti-Semite, oh, that's the next thing towards Satan himself. I mean, that's uh, like calling you Satan. They're a brush that the establishment uses to paint people black. So they're a bucket of black paint and a brush. That's the, that's the Anti-Defamation League. And then if you say anything about them, but those conspiracy theories fall apart when you remember the little clues scattered around the spotlight office. And then the conspiracy theories seem believable again when you learn that just a few months ago a Denver couple were awarded nearly ten million dollars because the ADL had falsely accused them of anti-Semitism. Thank God for the jury system. Feel your name has been cleared now? It sure has. And that's all we really want to say. This has been five and a half years. We're obviously disappointed, but beyond that, I don't think we want to say anything. Gail's point was that the spotlight is racist, so they must also be wrong about Bilderberg. Jim Tucker, for example, has to know that the spotlight support the notion of Holocaust denial. So his judgment on other things has to be questioned as well. But I wasn't convinced. I felt I had to meet Bilderberg members.
As the months progressed, our Portuguese car chase became the stuff of legend within the conspiracy theory world. Anti-New World Order talk shows were aflame with reports of my bravery. Come on over here and get on TV with me. That can be part of your film, you know, you were invited on the extremist broadcast because you guys actually made national, international news. I covered it here like last year in Centra, Portugal. You had some guy in black sunglasses try to run you off and... Well, we went to a Bilderberg meeting in Portugal and we tried to get into the meeting and then a man in a dark green Lancia chased us all over Portugal, but it turned out okay. All right, bud. Well, certainly good talking to you and we're just glad to, glad to have you here. Thank you, thank you. For All that right, you bet, you bet. I spent months contacting Bilderberg attendees for interviews, but most, like Peter Mandelson, didn't even reply to my letters. I remembered something that Paul Luckman had said back in Portugal about Bilderberg's culture of secrecy. I'm talking to one of the, the editors on the um, on the business desk, city desk. But the minute I mentioned Bilderberg, it just changed the subject totally. I and said, did you hear what I said? I said yes. I said, do you know about them? Um, yeah, I've heard about them. And just nothing else. The conversation does not happen. We won't even talk about it. So it was all the more incredible that after months of trying, I was suddenly invited to meet the Secretary General of the Bilderberg Group, a secret ruler of the world himself, should you believe the conspiracy theorists. But you have done very well in keeping Bilderberg out of the public consciousness. There's Thank no you. denying that. And that's what you wanted to do, is keep it out of the public consciousness. We don't... I, I don't think it's true to say that we want to keep it out. We've never wanted to get it in. We don't encourage people to mention it in the mainstream press because we, we don't encourage, um, you know, idle speculation about what we do. We forbid individual attendees to give press meetings at our conferences. And we do that not because we're secrecy mad, but because we want to control the politicians who come. I mean, you know, we, if we let them, they would all give press conferences they all want to go on television every day. You know, they're insane. You can't get people to talk honestly to one another, especially in front of political opponents in their own country, if they're going to be quoted because people will only talk freely if they know they're not going to be quoted and distorted by prurient, uh, ambitious journalists like you. It's a private organisation, and we live in an age which can't distinguish privacy from secrecy. And privacy is then seen as secrecy, and secrecy is sinister by definition. Why are you happy to talk about it? Because you asked me. Especially if I'm answering claptrap from idiots uh, who have no knowledge of it but think they can improve their public image by attacking it. An appropriate venue is a comfortable but not necessarily luxurious hotel which is remote and peaceful uh, but not too far from a major airport and um, there aren't many of those. We invite people to come to the meeting and we organise the panels and somebody orders the wine and food. So, are you like a headhunter? You, you, because a lot of people who have been to Bilderberg have gone on to be president or prime minister. Tony Blair came the, the year I first went, 93, that's right, and, uh, and uh, Bill Clinton a couple of years before he became president. We're looking for people who are thoughtful, um, either are or are going to be influential. I don't think we're as good at talent spotting as you suggest, actually. Conspiracy theorists, of course, say that it's not about talent spotting, it's about bringing these people in and then making them the next president or prime minister. Uh, if the conspiracy theorists saw the difficulty we had in actually organising a meeting, I don't think they would credit us with such supernatural powers. It was never uh, a policy-making organisation. It was always a policy-discussing organisation David Rockefeller was involved, Henry Kissinger also, Jack Hines, who was the head of the Hines Baked Beans Corporation. And uh, it was a way of bringing together politicians, industrialists, financiers and journalists from the whole of the Western world to talk about things so that they had a better feel for one another's attitudes. And as you know, politics 
should involve people who are not politicians. Yeah, well, I think he made a mistake by being so secret at the early stages. And I think initially there was a lot of secrecy. But secrecy is rather stupid. And I think Bilderberg would probably agree that they made a mistake. And some of the business people get rather carried away and old Henry Kissinger arrives with his security posse and everything like this. But it does have a serious element in that some of these people have actually had their lives threatened. Conspiracy theorists say that the ultimate Bilderberg agenda is a one-world government. I think that's exaggerated, but not totally unfair, in the sense that those of us in Bilderberg really felt that we couldn't go on forever fighting one another for nothing and uh, killing people and rendering millions homeless. And... Uh, to the extent that we could have a single community throughout the world would be a good thing. Does it help a career to go to a build and move meeting? No, I don't think going helped your career. I think, in a way, when you got a job, you had more influence in the global field. Isn't that in some way a conspiracy? Oh, come off it, dear boy. Look, you get on in the BBC because you suck up to the people who will say, look, go and talk to Dennis Healy. Channel 4. Yes, that's yeah, right. Oh, no, uh, Channel 4, even worse, because that's commercial. I mean, uh, you might as well say you're uh, really uh, trying to be, promote the interests of the people who advertise on Channel 4. Even I don't believe that. As always in conferences of this kind, um, many of the most important interactions take place, um, take place privately, you know, at the breakfast table. Hearing the Bilderbergers talk made me wonder whether they were a conspiracy and they just didn't realise that they were. People who are there and talk and talk privately at a dinner deserve to have their conferences respected. For me, the value has been building a group of, of friends, a network, if you like, um, people who I've come to know and have come to know me. In the end, maybe the secret room is no more than a place to network, just like any golf club. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? It depends on whether you're a member of the golf club. The conspiracy theorists are right. The New World Order exists, although we have a different name for it. They're by and large internationalists. The business people tend to come from the bigger international uh, companies, and it is very sensible. But th that is the world. That is the way it happens in the world, and quite rightly so. What's wrong with that? And what happens to those people who oppose this new world order? They're like twigs in the tidal wave. If you don't have the right attitude, if you don't have the right belief system, you can be put up against a wall by these people. That's what they do. People who went to Bilderberg meetings as many times as... Um, Dennis Healy, including the first one, there's no way they don't know what it's really about. No way. Is Dennis Healy a shape-shifting reptile? Don't know. I haven't done his genealogy, but um, does he know what's going on? Absolutely. One day, a few months ago, a bike messenger pulled up outside my house and dropped a package through the door. It was the minutes of the Bilderberg Portugal Conference. Clearly someone within Bilderberg considered me a fellow traveller. I was curious to know what Jim might make of it. Uh, oh, are you, let me tell me uh, who gave it to you. I don't want to tell you. Okay. I don't want to tell you. Is it exciting to have this document? Oh, yes. There's no such thing as too much information. The truth was clear and uncomfortable. There was no smoking gun, no plots, no intrigue. It could have been the minutes of any left-leaning globalist think tank. It was a disappointment. It does uh, look rather dull. Uh, you can uh, feel quite confident that anything that would uh, embarrass him if it became known publicly would be uh, not, not included. In the end, for Jim, the exclusion of anything embarrassing was proof of the conspiracy. So how are you feeling right now? Vindicated. 
On the record, the Bilderbergers told me that they didn't care about the conspiracy theories and that they found them ridiculous. I've heard of Jim Tucker. I can't say I find them particularly enlightening. I perhaps ought to tell you that um, when I became Secretary General, I mean, I, I, I had a choice. Um, I could either take an immense interest in all the people who poked around and were on the web writing about Bilderberg, or broadly speaking, I could ignore them and get on with my life. And I didn't find it difficult to make the second decision. But off the record, some Bilderbergers admitted that they loved the conspiracy theories and are always surfing the internet. And I wondered whether the real conspiracy was between the Bilderbergers and those who believed in their evil power. Perhaps both sides like to think that Bilderberg rules the world because the truth is more alarming, that nothing but the flow of money rules the world and nobody controls anything. One of the most frightening things, of course, if you are anywhere near people who are in charge of governments or large businesses, is how they too are like corks bobbing around on the stream of what's, of what's carrying on. I mean, people hugely overestimate the ability of individuals to change the course of history at the moment. So do you think it's impossible for anybody to secretly rule the world? I'm absolutely convinced it's impossible for anybody secretly to rule the world. But Jim is undaunted. He thinks that my interviews with Bilderbergers have solved none of the mysteries. He says he's gone too far to quit now. I'm pretty much blacklisted from the establishment the newspapers, and I was part of the establishment for tw the first 20 years of my newspaper life. Friends you've known for 20 or 30 years, used to see a lot, drink with, chase girls with. They can't take your call. They're always out of the office. They know there's something up there that they better stay away from. It's evil, very evil. And for, for so long as I live, I'm going to try to shine a light into that dark corner called Bilderberg. You're making me feel awful damn important. Dennis Healy told me that he took many photographs inside Bilderberg meetings. I felt we were getting along well. We were fellow globalists, and I was anxious to see his photographs, see the mood, the faces. Have you got any in a, in a nearby album we could see? No. Oh. That was the last in the series of The Secret Rulers of the World, but the book of the series, Them, by John Ronson, is out now, priced £16. You can order your copy directly from the Channel 4 shop with free postage and packaging on 0870 1234 344 or click on to channel4.com forward slash shop. Getting to the heart of British politics, four placed three youngsters in each of the three main political parties to see what really goes on in the run-up to a general election. Party crashers, tomorrow at 7.30 on 4.